Okay, good evening. Today we're going to open up with the words of our founder and the one who laid the cornerstone for city, uh, cell block to city block, Elder uh, Musa Mata, who was a real inspiration and a guiding light uh, for us. And these are his words right here. Any serious study of human history would disclose that there has always been those of us who put up constant resistance to injustices. Otherwise, it would be impossible for others to come to the realization that certain acts being perpetuated against them are unjust because whether we want to acknowledge it or not there are those who are so dominated psychologically by the controlling culture until they consider the adverse treatment which they are subjected to as being just this is clearly evident in the incarcerated environment where individuals who won't accept the challenge engaged from each other will bend over backward to appease those who demonstrate with arrogance that their goals and objectives that their goals and objectives are to dehumanize whenever possible and that they can do it with impunity and from their injustice. Those were the words from Elder Musumata who is now resting in peace. You know, may his name forever be a spoken spoken amongst the living. And uh, they directly relate to our topic today, which is mainly Black August, but the prison resistance movement in itself. Uh, to give you a little background on BA, Black August, for, for, uh, we'll use BA to mean Black August. It was the brainchild of the fallen comrade, uh, Jeffrey Katari Galton, who came up with this ideal to commemorate the struggles that was uh, waged against the pretty much boot of oppression of Gestapo, a Gestapo-like regime of racist uh, prison guards within the city within the CDC system. Uh, while it is undisputed by all accounts that CDC is the bedrock, you know what I'm saying, me, which Black August stems from, however, it would be remiss of us to not acknowledge all the other countless acts, you know what I'm saying, me, that were committed by the people that were just as courageous of the African diaspora, you know what I'm saying, over centuries during the same time period. Today we are blessed to have with us the oldest surviving member of that prison, of that prison resistance. Mr. Terry Samaki Williams, glad to see you, and he's going to uh, give us some insight into the prison resistance movement and Black August itself, and amongst other things. Uh, but for the most part, before we get into the crux of our interview, could you give us a little background on yourself? It's like, where did you grow up, and what sort of childhood did you have? Uh, I grew up right here in Stockton, California. Uh, for the most part, my education was cut off at age 14. I was uh, kicked out of school permanently at age 14 in eighth grade. I was not allowed to go back to school in the state of California. And my mother and father uh, had differences of opinion as to my how my education should go. So my mother was opposed to me going back south to go to school because, well, you know, we're talking about the 60s, like 62, 63. My mother was opposed to me going back south and going to school. So for the most part, I was a product of this environment out on the south side of Stockton, California, in the streets around the, the drugs, the gambling shacks, and that kind of thing. And uh, I went to the military when I got drafted at 19. And the same year I went to the military, I also ended up in prison. I got in a shootout with the police in uh, 1970, and I ended up going to prison. And uh, while in prison, I was blessed to meet the revolutionaries, and uh, it's been it's been there for me ever since, because uh, my soul just resonates with that, mm -hmm. you know, coming out of coming out of our motherland, and I stayed with that because that's where my education began. I don't have a formal education, like I said, I never got past the eighth grade out here. So when I got in there, my education was through these brothers taught me how to go back and read and write, mm -hmm. and get my GED. And of course, uh, learning my own history, by my, my own history, I mean my African history. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about the prison resistance movement and NBA, NBA itself, especially that one, one, especially that of infamy and notoriety that stems from propaganda disseminated by repressive or prison officials. They, for the most part, have persuaded to publicly believing that you are were nothing more than a bunch of criminal thugs and terrorists who wanted to only control all the criminal activity in prison with the goal of one day returning to society to uh, build a criminal empire. Could you clear up uh, uh, many of those misconceptions and expose it as being nothing but fake news? Well, quite the contrary. We were anything but a criminal element because what we did, we fought against uh, 
that we, if, if, uh, if uh, someone's in there dealing drugs, we were not allowed to deal drugs. We, we were not permitted to uh, participate in homosexual acts. We were not uh, allowed to uh, uh, go off and get involved in race riots and those type of things. We struggled against oppression. We didn't struggle against uh, any particular race. We didn't struggle against uh, uh, another element of the prison population. Mm -hmm. uh, we struggled against injustice and oppression. Mm -hmm. And that is still the case today wow. for those who are, are, are true to life in this struggle. It's always against oppression. It's not against race. It's not about being a racist. It's not about uh, crim that criminal element. I, uh, so I would disagree strongly with that. Um, my first time going to prison uh, and my first time ever being arrested, period, what led to me being kicked out of school was uh, somebody uh, referring to me as a nigger, and I'm anything but that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and it's the same It's the same here today when we see what's going on in America today. Mm -hmm. uh, I, struggle, I struggle for those who, who can't struggle, those, these young men that's out here today. That's, uh, uh, with all the horror stories associated with prison, what was it like for you when you first came? Were you afraid? No, I was never afraid uh, because I came from directly from the army, from basic training in the army into prison, and so uh, I, I came. You know, physically I, I was well, I was always pretty good with my hands, so to that part I was never afraid. Uh, but I did come to prison at a time. Uh, is it raining? Excuse me. Excuse me. I can like hear the rain. Yeah, we yeah we can go inside if you guys want to. But I uh, I came to prison at a time when there there were only when I came to DVI in 1970 there were only two black correctional officers in the, in the whole prison, and so we had that good old boys network that was going on there, and uh, uh, we were we were being uh, oppressed. I mean, in a real way. I ain't just talking about we we faced we faced real racism, mm -hmm. not like the subtle stuff that you see today. We we've seen where uh, brothers were beat down and gassed. I, I I've been maced on more than one occasion myself. I've been in those strip cells. Uh, back then, they had what they call strip cells. They mean literally stripped down, butt naked, no socks, no shorts, no nothing, and thrown in a cell with a cement slab. No no mattress, no blanket, nothing. And they, they of course, uh, as time went on, the laws forbid them to continue that practice. Mm -hmm. But that was, that was one they did have, particularly for us, who they considered to be a, a revolutionary element. Mm -hmm. How were you able to make that transition from that old man mentality? I know we all come into prison, we all have a criminal mentality to the extent. How were you mm -hmm. able to make that transition from that criminal man mentality to that of a new man conscious mentality. Basically well, you came from reactionary to revolutionary in a sense. I think it came with, with consistency in my practice and practicing because we had back then in, in prison we had these black culture classes where every Friday we didn't have that what you see today the crip blood the, those those didn't even exist at the time we had uh, we had revolutionary black culture classes, and we would be meet in the middle of the yard, and it didn't matter what set you was from or what color you from or whatever. We would meet and have PE classes in the middle of the yard. We talked about. See, I, I went to prison knowing nothing about my history, and I came out of there being able to speak different language. I came out of there being able to uh, talk about uh, black history, religion, uh, philosophy. And, and it all started on the prison yard. I didn't get it from the University of Pacific or Yale or Harvard. I got it from Africans who would meet me on the, on the weight pile and pull me away from the weight pile. Let's finish, let's go over here and, and have a dialogue about, about, about your history, about getting these lessons done. Before, before I could return back to the weight pile, I had to go over here with these elders and sit down and listen and respectfully, mm -hmm. I had to sit down and listen. You know, they had something to say. You know, uh, we know that DA is, you know, we established that DA is the brainchild of Jerry Katari, Golden, but, you know, there were circumstances that, you know, came before that. You know, were you able to be a part of some of those individuals that came before that that's associated 
you know, with VA right now, such as George Lester Jackson, uh, oh, for sure, W.L. Yeah. Nolan, uh, William Christmas, and Tony Gibson, many others that was part of the uh, uh, beginning days of the movement. Uh, how was that for them? Could you describe to them the true meaning of what they were about and why they were able to do what caused them to put you know, that resistance movement together? Well, some of those brothers I was blessed to know personally, uh, including uh, all of those that was in the San Quentin Six. Uh, George was still alive at the time when I first came to prison. Um, the thing was, with, with the brothers, like when on the day when W.L. was killed, uh, what happened with George was a consequence of what happened to W.L. When you look at what happened in San Quentin, that was a consequence of what happened to, you know, and, and it, it, every, it, for every time they took an action, uh, what happened uh, in DVI, there's always a consequence to the action that the, that the uh, CDC had taken against the brothers, beating brothers in the head, mason brothers gassing till they couldn't breathe and then passed out, died. Uh, there was a reaction to that, uh, and it was always a consequence to it. their actions first. It was not like we just decide, okay, we're just going to wake up and, and uh, kill a pig today. Mm. And that wasn't that kind of part. It was a thing where, well, well, they've done this. We just got tired of accepting that. You're going to beat us down today? We, we ain't, uh, we, well, we had that what I would call a, a field nigga mentality. Mm. We wasn't the house niggas, and we ain't going to accept that. Uh, this ain't this ain't Alabama, and we just ain't gonna accept that that type of uh, uh, beat down. Mm -hmm. Not without you getting it. My mother have to cry and go to a funeral today. Yours gonna be crying tomorrow, and that was uh, unfortunately we had to take that attitude in order to survive. It was survival. It wasn't just strictly about us uh, uh, doing these things. We weren't trying to prove anything to anybody. But mm -hmm. young young brothers had to come up. We were forced. Mm -hmm. We were forced into that struggle. There was a war that went on from about 1967 all the way to about 1980. And if you look at that plaque in front of San Quentin where there was, what, 14 correctional officers got killed, every one of them, if you go back and look at that and look at the history, what happened just prior to those, you'll see that there was a consequence behind something that they had done. They don't put that on the plaque. Mm -hmm. They put the plaque up there that these officers were just minding their own business and somebody came up and attacked them, but that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And listening to you, I'm, I'm, I'm gathering that that through your exposure to George and W.L. Nolan and Katari and the different ones, and, and, and as well as the education and things you was able to obtain by being around them and being exposed to some of the teachers that they because I went in uh, uneducated, uh, and it's fair to say I went in kind of fairly ignorant, one of those wild young young blacks. I didn't want to do nothing but lift weights and, and, and participate in, in, in a lot of the negativity on the yard. Mm -hmm. But as they pulled me to the side and told me, you know, you have potential to do this, you have potential to do better things. You come from, you, you come, you're a descendant of kings and queens, so you have to stop acting like that. You know, you have to come up and show some type of VA by extension and other activities, you know, was, was something that was based on a righteous and just cause. I mean, it's been proven over and over. Why do you think that the prison officials went to such a concentrated effort to concentrated effort to talk, to try to suppress all the activities associated with the prison resistance movement and VA itself, based on that you guys were doing a good thing by pretty much uplifting and elevating the mentality of those you guys were around? Well, our exposure of the truth. Our exposure of the truth. Truth, the truth being that uh, uh, we were uh, 